Peace and blessings. Happy Sabbath. Thanks for joining us today. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say all praises be unto the Most High, Almighty, Ahaya Yashahaya Christ, our Lord and Savior, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. This is the Essene Community Church of Christ. My name is Bishop Tabak. And Brother Saul. And we are here to bring you today's um, Sabbath report slash lesson. Now, um, today's lesson is on the true understanding of tithes. So we're going to be examining the scriptures, going through the scriptures, see what it says, how tithes were first instituted, why they were instituted, um, and uh, what has become of it going forward in the New Testament. Uh, so with that being said, we're going to get right to it. Uh, we're going to start off at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. This is Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? All right, so who has believed our report? Who's going to believe this report that we have today? Um, and, who, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? All right, so usually what happens is, you know, the word of the Lord goes to a chosen vessel. Um, that chosen vessel then goes to the people and tells the people, thus say the most high, and it's up for the people to decide whether that chosen vessel is speaking the things coming from the most high or not. All right. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, we're going to start at St. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. St. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All right, so Christ here is letting us know uh, first thing you do is to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All right? And um, we're going to be taking a look exactly at, you know, what that entails, what this so-called seeking the kingdom first entails or you know what what um goes along with seeking the kingdom all right let's go to psalms chapter 112 starting at the first verse this is psalms 112 or 112 sorry uh verse one praise ye the lord blessed is the man that heareth the lord that delighteth greatly in his commandments huh, so Psalms chapter 112, verse starting at the first verse here, says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. All right? So, you know, part of seeking the kingdom is, you know, understanding the fear of the Lord. When you seek the kingdom, you start to understand the fear of the Lord and what that entails exactly. All right? Fear not actual fear because God didn't give us the spirit of fear. So this fear that they're explaining here in Psalms is more of a respect. All right? Blessed is the man that respected the Lord, that delighted greatly in his commandments. All right? If you have respect for the Lord, you're going to delight greatly in his commandments. All right? It's kind of like when children first learn respect, um, you know, growing up. How they learn it is they learn it through fear, all right? Uh, fear of something, you know what I mean? Fear of authority, fear of the Father. This is uh, ex Exodus chapter 34, verse 19. All that openeth the matrix is mine, and every firstling among thy cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. All right, so Exodus chapter 34, um, Verse 19 here is letting us know that all that openeth the matrix belongs to the Father. All right? Is mine. All right? All that openeth, openeth meaning first out the matrix. All right? And we understand the matrix to be the womb. So whether the womb is of the earth or whether the womb of a woman. All right? All that openeth the matrix is mine. All right, and the firstling 
among thy cattle, whether ox, sheep, that is male. All right, so um, so not only man, mankind, not only the, the first of mankind, but also cattle as well, all right, belongs to God. I'm going to go to Numbers chapter 3. This is Numbers chapter 3, starting from verse 9. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And I beheld, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine, because of all the firstborn, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land in the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. Mine shall they be. I am the Lord. All right. So Numbers chapter three is letting us know that in place of all that openeth the matrix, all right, the Levites are in place of them. All right. Um, the Levites shall be given to Aaron and his sons. All right, let's get that out of the George Lams Lamza translation. This is uh, Numbers chapter 3, verse 9 of the George Lamza translation. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given to him as a gift out of the children of Israel. All right, so in here in the Aramaic translation, it's letting us know here that um, the Levites are given to Aaron as a gift, all right? Whereas in the Masoretic text, the KJV, it doesn't mention a gift. It just says they are wholly given, all right? So in the George Lamza translation, it's mentioning that they are wholly given to him as a gift out of the children of Israel. Continue. Verse 10. And you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest, priest's office and the stranger that comes near shall be put to death. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of all the firstborn, that opened the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine. All right. So, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that opened the womb among the children of Israel. All right, so they were taken in their steed. All right. Um, therefore, the Levites shall be mine. So now, just like how, you know, the Most High said in Exodus chapter 34, starting at the 19th verse, he's letting them know that the children, um, Salakia, the Levites, the tribe of Levite, it belongs to him. All right, continue. Verse 13, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated to me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. All right, so... Verse 13 is letting us know that because all the firstborn are belong to the Most High, just like we read in Exodus chapter 34, um, he consecrated all the firstborn in Israel to himself, both man and beast. All right? So we consecrated the beast as well. All right? So they're looked at as holy. All right, once the Most High consecrates something or some people or some someone, they are seen as holy. 
let's continue. Let's go to Exodus chapter 23, starting at the 19th verse. This is Exodus 23, verse 19. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Here, Exodus chapter 23, verse 19 is letting us know that not only are the um, mankind and animals, uh, the first fruits of mankind and the first fruits of animals belong to him, he's also letting us know the first fruits of the land, the vegetation. Thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. All right? So he wants the first of the first fruits of the land. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 14 and start at the 22nd verse. This is Deuteronomy 14, starting at the 22nd verse. Thou shalt truly tithe all, thy, all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. All right. So here in Deuteronomy chapter 14, starting at the 22nd verse, it's letting us know here that this is the first time that tithes was set up as a commandment. The children of Israel are given the breakdown as to what to do with the tithes. He's letting them know that thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bring forth year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thine oil. These are the feast of weeks. Um, harvest harvesting um, foods that are being mentioned here all right feast of first fruits we understand it's a it's a feast of uh, a 50 day celebration so every 50 days there's a new offering that has to come um, depending on the harvest once they reap the harvest so the first the first one is barley all right so for Feast of First Fruits, when they first start, they're bringing the barley. After 50 days later, after that, they're gonna bring a new wheat. 50 days after that, they're gonna bring wine. 50 days after that, they're gonna bring oil. All right, so this is what's being mentioned here. All right, to let them know that everything that they're getting, they have to give to the Most High first. All right, and the Most High left representatives to represent him on the earth. So who they're giving to are the Levites and the priests in place of the Most High, for the Most High. Continue. Verse 24. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thy hand, and thou shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt rejoice, thou and thy household. All right. So what's being mentioned here is, you know, if it becomes too burdensome, depending on where you live, all right, because there's, gonna, there's a certain place that the Most High would like you to celebrate um, this, this feast, all right, and, and partake of the tithing. All right, so if, you, if you're not able to do so, all right, he set up something where you can um, do it another way, so to speak, or um, you can turn it into money and whatever thy soul lusted after, all right, you're going to eat that in front of the Most High, 
and rejoice, all right, and be happy, all right, because this is supposed to be a feast of celebrating. So the Most High didn't want you to feel like it's really burdensome uh, for the children of Israel to be celebrating this, this feast here. That's being mentioned. All right, continue. Yeah, just to add that, that's probably where they got the concept of like a bank instead of carrying gold. Mm -hmm, they give mm -hmm. you a note and yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Verse uh, 27 there. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. And at the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thy increase the same year and shall lay it up within thy gate and the Levite because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest all right so it's being mentioned here that at the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tide of thy increase the same year and shall lay it up within thy gates. All right? Because there's going to be an abundance that's going to come with this tide. All right? There's going to be an abundance. So with the rest of the stuff, you're going to, you know, you're going to leave it for the Levite the stranger, the fatherless, the widow that is within thy gates and they shall eat and be satisfied. All right. So the Most High is teaching the children of Israel here to remember those that are less fortunate than you. All right. All the increase, everything belongs to God. So anything that anybody gets, it's coming from him. If you get something from the Most High, it's according to His will. It fits within the parameters of His will, and that's why you got it. All right? So, this is different for everybody. So, for the Levite, because he has no land, all right, he's not going to have no fruits to reap from, okay? No harvest to reap from. All right? He doesn't have, um, you know, cattle as well, the Levite. They don't hold it personally. All right? But it's given to them afterwards. All right? So we have to remember the Levite as well as the fatherless. All right? The stranger, the widow. All right? These people that are being mentioned here you know, are the less fortunate because they don't have the inheritance, some of them, all right? The fatherless, if you don't have a father, what are you gonna inherit? Inheritances come from the father, all right? The spiritual father and the earthly father, all right, in a household, all right? If you're a widow and you lost your husband, all right, maybe that husband died before he could build an inheritance to pass on, all right? Not only that, you know, maybe what was coming in once is not coming in again. So it's hard for the widow to take care of herself, all right? So this is why the Most High is, you know, instituting these rules here, all right? To, to show us how to be righteous and to do good works. All right, so the understanding that we're getting here from these tithing principles in Deuteronomy chapter 14 um, is how to do good works, all right? Tithes are used for good works, all right? Let's get the definition of a tithe in the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. This is the definition of tithe from the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. Tithe, tip, tenth. Tenth part of one's income set aside for a specific use to the government of Ecclesiastes. Okay, so a tithe is a tenth. All right, tithe means tenth. All right, 
tenth part of one's income set aside for a specific use. All right, to the government or ecclesiastics. All right, so your government could be the government of God or it could be, you know, a government setup like how we have today. All countries have a government setup, so to speak. All right, continue. Its origin is unknown, but it goes back far beyond the time of Moses. And it was practiced in the lands from Babylon to Rome. Abram gave tithe to Melchizedek, um, Genesis 14 and 20, Hebrews 7, 2 and 6. Jacob promised tithes to God. All right, so it's making mention here that, you know, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. So there was tithing going on before it was instituted within the children of Israel. So before the children of Israel, before the 12 tribes, the forefathers were tithed. Okay? Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. All right? And Jacob promised to give tithes to God. All right? This was um, after Jacob's dream, when Jacob had a dream, and he noticed where he put down his head to rest, he was on holy land. All right, and he understood, he had the faith to understand that God's gonna give him an increase. All right, so he promised to tithe once he got the increase. He had the faith and the understanding that he was gonna get an increase, an abundance of stuff from coming from the Lord. All right, hence he was able to promise tithes to God. Continue. Jacob promised tithes to God, um, Genesis 28 and 22. Mosaic law required tithing of all produce of land and herds used for support of Levites and priests. Additional tithes may have been required at certain times. There were penalties for cheating in tithing. Pharisees tithed even herbs. All right, so... The tithes were used for support of Levites and the priests because they were set up to do the things, the service of the temple and of God and to be that representative of God. All right? So because of that, whatever gift that was supposed to go to God, whatever tithes that was supposed to go to God, it went to the Levites and the priests so that they can continue to work and hopefully they would be able to, you know, keep the charge with what they're getting and use it for what the Most High wanted them to use it for. All right, so there were penalties for cheating in tithing. All right, like the scriptures is, or like um, the Bible dictionary is letting us know here. All right, there were penalties. So this was something very serious. And we're going to get a little bit more into that later on in the lesson. All right. And it's also made mention that Pharisees tithe even herbs. All right. So everybody was contributing to this so-called, you know, um, to the church or to the temple. All right. To God. They were contributing. They were tithing. All right. So the most I hear had to institute this tithing. He set it up first as a commandment. All right. We're going to continue. We're going to go into the works of Flavius Josephus um, and see his account on how Israel kept the Feast of First Fruits. The works of Flavius Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 3, Chapter 10, Fifth Paragraph. Concerning the festivals and how each day of such festival is to be observed. But on the second day of unleavened bread, which is the 16th day of the month, they first partake of the fruits of the earth. For before that day, they do not touch them. And while they suppose it proper to honor God, from whom they obtain this plentiful provision, 
in first place. They offer the first fruits of their barley and that in the manner following. They take a handful of the ears and dry them, then beat, then beat them small and purge the barley from the bran. They then bring one tenth deal to the altar to God and cast one handful of it upon the fire. They leave the rest of the use of the priest. And after this, it is that they may publicly or privately reap their harvest. Josephus is letting us know once they get the first fruits of the earth, they prepare it and they present it to the priests. And after they present a portion to the priests, now they may reap their harvest, whether it be publicly or privately. So now they can, you know, partake of their crops. All right, but they have to make sure that they give it to God first, a, a tenth, a tithe of the crops. All right? It has to go to God to, to show him that, you know, we remember him. We understand that this comes from you. And by them, by them tithing, this is what they're showing. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 16, starting at the ninth verse. We're going to take a look at the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost so, okay, or Pentecost or the Feast of First Fruits. So Deuteronomy chapter 16, starting at the ninth verse. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. And thou shalt keep the Feast of Weeks until the Lord thy God with the tribute of a free will offering of thine hand which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God has blessed thee. All right. So, and, thou, and verse 10 here says, And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of a free will offering of thy hand. All right. So a free will offering. All right. An offering out of free will which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God has blessed thee. All right, so coming with this keeping of the feast of first, of the feast of weeks, you have to give a tribute of a free will offering. Verse 11, And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son, and thy daughter, and thy manservant, servant, and thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are among you, in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. All right, so. After the new year, the first holiday that was set up for the children of Israel to do was the Feast of First Fruits. And this holy day consists of tithing. All right, this is a holy day that the Most High was teaching the children of Israel on how to tithe. So the first holy day is a tithing holy day. Why would the Most High set up the first holy day to be something of a tithing celebration? Let's continue. Uh, we'll go to Ezekiel chapter 44, starting at the third, 30th verse. This is Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. And the first of all the fruit, first fruits of all things, and every oblation of all, every sort of your oblations, shall be the priests. Ye shall also give unto the priests the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thy house. All right, so here it's making mention again. And the first fruits, and the first of all, the first fruits of all things, whether that be man, cattle, or vegetation coming from the land. All right, first of all, first fruits of all things. 
okay? And every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblations. All right? Shall be the priest. Because the priest is the representative of God here on earth in the setup of Israel at this time. All right? Let's get the definition of oblation. So the definition of oblation, uh, Hebrew Strong, 8641, Teroma, the second form used in Deuteronomy 12, verse 11, from H7311, a present as offered up, especially in sacrifice or as a tribute, gift, heave offering, shoulder, oblation, Offered, offering. All right, so an oblation, all right, the Strong's is describing an oblation, giving us the definition as an oblation is a present. All right? Especially in sacrifice or as tribute. And we understand tribute to be also taxes. Okay? Um, it's a gift. An oblation is a gift. A heave offering, oblation, offered offering, okay? So when you offer your first fruits, all right, you're offering a tithe of the first fruits, all right? And that tithe is considered a present, a gift, tribute, all right? So with that being said, the Most High gave a commandment to tithe in order to teach the children of Israel how to give gifts. All right? It was first instituted as a commandment. It's, it's like the government today. We got to pay taxes to the government, right? They set up a certain percentage that we got to pay. They got that from the Father. If they didn't, exactly, if they didn't institute taxes, who would be paying taxes out of their own free will? And it's not that God needs these tithes, all right? He don't need a tithe, all right? So it's not about, it's not about him in need of things, all right? He instituted this for a specific reason, for us to learn something from it, the importance of it, all right? To learn that... A tithe, a.k.a. oblation, is a present, all right, as tribute. Let's get the definition out of the Strong's of offering. It's the definition of uh, offering out of the Hebrew Strong's, 4503. Minkah, from an unused root, meaning to a, to a portion that is bestowed, a donation, Euphemistically, euphemistically tribute, specifically a sacrificial offering, usually bloodless and voluntary, gift, oblation, meat, offering, present, sacrifice. In the definition of oblation, it was mentioned offering. We go to offering now. Offering, definition of offering. Um meaning to a portion that is bestow a donation all right so tithe all right tithe is also seen as an oblation also seen as an offering all right also seen as a donation all right euphemistically tribute again the word tribute AKA taxes, right? Or to pay tribute, right? Specifically, a sacrificial offering, usually bloodless and voluntary, all right? So it's bloodless and it's voluntary. It's not something of a commandment, sort of speak, all right? It was instituted as a commandment at first, all right? So that we would get the gist of how to give a gift, a good gift, all right? 
Because there's a way to give a gift. You don't give it because you have to. All right? This was the, this was the case with uh, Cain and Abel. All right? Abel gave out of the goodness of his own heart. He wanted to give. Cain just did it because he felt that he had to. All right? So there's a, there's a, a sort of specific sense behind giving. And how are we to give? It's not just about giving, but, you know, what's behind that giving? All right? So, it's a gift. All right? Offering is a gift. A tithe is a gift. Oblation is a gift. All right? This is what the Most High wanted to teach us through tithing. How to give gifts properly. Let's get the definition of donation. It's the definition of donation. Noun. An act or instance of presenting something as a gift, grant, or contribution. A gift as to a fund, contribution. A donation is a gift, grant, or contribution. Continue. It's the origin of donation. 1375 to 1425. For an earlier sense, late Middle English, equivalent to donators, par past participle of donare, to give, don, stem of donum, gift, or state. Okay, so the origin of donation is to give. To give. Let's continue. We're going to go to First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29. This is First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29. Give thanks to the Lord with the honor due to his name. Bring offerings and give thanks before him with the prayer of your, of your mouth. Worship the Lord with holy songs. All right. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29, telling us to give thanks to the Lord with the honor due to his name. Bringing offerings. And give thanks before him with the prayer of your mouth. Worship the Lord with holy songs. All right? So give honor where honors do. All right? Bring offerings. Bring a gift to the Lord and give thanks. Because that gift that you're bringing to him, he gave to you first. That's why you have it. All right? Again, it was, it fit in the parameters of the Most High's will. Now he gave you something, what are you going to do with it? So he's, he, Mo, Christ, the Most High, is not trying to set us up to fail. Alright? So this is why he instituted tithing. Alright? He instituted it so that we wouldn't fail at learning how to give properly and be thankful all right this is why tithes were instituted because if the most high never told the children of israel to do this they would never do it all right let's continue let's go to malachi chapter 3 starting at the 8th verse this is Malachi chapter 3 verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Alright, so the Most High in Malachi, during Malachi's time, is letting the children of Israel know that you're robbing, God, you're robbing me. You're robbing God in tithes and offerings. Alright, why? Because... I'm giving to you. You guys are getting. You're getting an increase. But you're not giving me honor. You're not reverencing me. To let me know that you understand that all this comes from God. All right, continue. Verse 9. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me. 
even this whole nation. All right, so what you're doing, you're not just doing it to me, you're doing it to the whole nation. Continue. Verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, said the Lord, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pull you out a blessing, that there shall be room enough to receive it. All right. So the Most High is letting them know. It's, the tithes are supposed to go into the storehouse. All right. That there may be meat in my house. All right. Why? Because the church has to look after people. Or the house of God. If someone is in need, when you're in need, where do you go? You're supposed to go to God, right? You're supposed to ask God. Ask and you shall receive, all right? He knows what we want before we ask, but he wants us to come to him first, all right? But we are to honor him, and how we honor him is by tithing, all right? So this is what he was really trying to, you know, break down to the children of Israel. Let's continue. Proverbs chapter, chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your crops so shall your barns be filled with plenty and your wine cresses shall burst with the new wine alright so the book of Proverbs here is letting us know that when you honor the Lord with your substance whatever you get from him whatever fit within the parameters of his will, all right? And with the first fruits of all your crops, so shall your barns be filled with plenty and your wine presses shall burst out with new wine, all right? You are going to get a, a, an abundance. This is what Proverbs is letting us know when we do these things. And we understand when the Most High promises something, his word is his bond. All right? Mosai has always been living up to his word. He does not lie. Christ does not lie. So if he tells you something, it's going to happen. You just have to be able to know what he's telling you and do it the right way. All right? So with the children of Israel, he wanted them to tithe with a pure heart. All right? You need a pure heart in order to, you know, to honor the Lord with. Not like Cain, okay, that just did it just because, you know, but like Abel, who did it out of the goodness of his heart. Let's continue. I'm going to go to Sirach chapter 12. This is Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, chapter 12, verse 1. When thou wilt do good, know to whom thou doest it, so shalt thou be thanked for thy benefits. All right. When thou wilt do good, know to whom thou doest it. Continue. Verse 2. Do good to the godly man, and thou shalt find a recompense. And if not from him, yet from the Most High. There can, be, there can no good come to him that is always occupied in evil nor to him that giveth no alms. Give to the godly man, and help not a sinner. Do well unto him that is lowly, but give not to the ungodly. Hold back thy bread, and give it not unto him, lest he overmaster thee thereby. For else thou shalt receive twice as much evil from all the good thou shalt have done unto him. All right, so... Sirach or Ecclesiasticus chapter 12 is letting us know give to the godly man and help not a sinner just like the Most High set it up right? You tithe your tithe supposed to go to who? The Levites and the priests alright? The priests being the representatives of God alright? And whoever is godly all right? The priest is the godly man. All right? The stranger, the, the, the widow, the fatherless, 
when they're in need, they're going to come to who? To God. And God's supposed to be able to suffice them. All right? So they're not considered the sinner. Because why? They're coming to God. They're the sinner that repented, which is no more looked at as a sinner. All right? So if they're coming to God, they're not in the same boat as the sinner. They're in the same boat as the godly man. Because you're going to God. All right? Continue. Verse 6. For the Most High hateth sinners and will repay vengeance unto the ungodly and keepeth them against the mighty day of their punishment. Give unto the good and help not the sinner. All right? So hold back not thy bread. All right? Sorry, hold back thy bread. All right? Give not to the ungodly. All right? Lest he overmaster thee thereby. Or else thou shalt receive twice as much evil for all the good thou shalt have done unto him. All right? So when you give to the ungodly, all right, you're going to receive twice as much evil for doing this. Isn't that, that's like paying taxes to the, the government, in a way. They're the ungodly. And they do overmaster you when you give to them. Yeah, but... The government set up. The reason right. why the governments are set up is from God too. Yeah. Right. It fits under the parameters of the will of God. Right. Yeah, so, true. you know. But we're gonna get into that later. All right. But what's the the main focus here is know who you're giving to. All right. Know who you're giving to. The Most High hated sinners. All right. Ones that don't repent. Everybody sins. Everybody falls short of the glory. All right, our filth, our filth, our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of the Most High. But once you repent, all right, you're no longer looked at as a sinner. All right, when you're in Christ, you're not a sinner. All right, give unto the good and help not the sinner. So know who you're giving to. You're gonna give to anybody. Know who you're gonna give to. Where where it's gonna go a long way. Where the Most High wants you to put that gift. Whose hands he wants you to put that gift in. Alright? The godly person. Why? Because he's doing all the things. And he's going to recognize that what you give him is coming from God. Alright? The godly person understands this. The sinner does not. So he doesn't reverence God for anything that he gets. All right? So this is how we are to act and to behave when we're giving. There's a way to give. All right? There's a right way to give. And this is what the Most High wanted us to understand through tithing. This is why tithing was such a commandment in the Old Testament. All right? And instituted for the first holy day out of the year. All right, and it wasn't just for, you know, the first holy day as well. It, for a couple other holy days as well. All right, but it was made sure to be placed in the Feast of First Fruits so that we understand gifting out the heart. All right, from the heart. Okay, not because, oh, I got to. So let's continue. Let's go to First John chapter 3. This is First John chapter three verse seventeen. But whoso hath this world, sorry. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Okay, actions speak louder than words. All right? So if you love your brother, you're going to you're going to show him that you love him with action. All right? Not by words, cuz words don't mean much if it's not backed up by action. 
all right? So whoso has this world's good, if you're getting an increase, all right, remember who it's coming from, all right? And the most high, yo, our whole life is a test, all right? Our whole life is a test. So if you're getting something good, the most high testing, testing you to see what you're going to do with that good, whether it be a lot of good that you're getting or a little bit of good that you're getting. This is Proverbs chapter 21, verse 25. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day, all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? All right. So here, Proverbs is letting us know the desire of the slothful killeth him. All right. For his hands refuse to labor. All right. So the slothful, you know, the lazy, the idle, it's, it killeth the slothful. That person, the idol, for his hands refuse to labor. All right, he cover he covet he coveteth greedily all day long. So he don't give. All right, he get if he gets, he keeps it, he covets it. But the righteous giveth and spare it not. All right, so God was teaching us everything that God teaches us and commands us. Is righteousness he's not gonna teach us to be to not be righteous all right we are the children of light the children of God if you're the children of light you're always gonna do things of the light all right you're always gonna do good all right um, The sacrifice of the wicked is, abom is abomination, all right? So when they give, when the wicked give, right? They're not giving willingly, all right? How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind, all right? Just like the example of Cain, all right? He gave a sacrifice with a wicked mind. And not willingly. Alright? This is not righteous in the sight of the Most High. Alright? So we are not to do this. Alright? So there's an example here of what not to do. Alright? Let's continue. I'm going to go into St. Matthew chapter 27. So St. Matthew chapter 27 verse 3. Then Judas which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying i have sinned in that i have betrayed the innocent blood and they said what is that to us see thou to that and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself all right so here judas after betraying Christ, all right, he was feeling bad now, all right? He, he, he betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver, all right? And he went back to them now, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood, all right? He betrayed somebody that was innocent, all right? So his conscience getting at him right now, all right? And they said, what is that to us? Like, what is that to us? That has nothing to do with us, how you feeling. All right, what you did. <laughs> right? Even though they asked him to do it, they commissioned him to do this. They charged him to do this. All right? See down to that. Like, you know, see that by yourself. All right? So, continue. Is verse 6 and the chief priest took the silver pieces and said 
it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. All right, so they understood that this money that's coming that we commissioned Judas with, all right, he threw it back on the ground to us, right? He don't want it because of his guilty conscience now, all right? We can't take this money and put it back into the treasury, all right? Because this is blood money now. All right, this is, this is money that's not coming from goodness. It's not willingly, all right? It's not coming out of, you know, own free will. This is not a gift. This is, this is not a gift, all right? This was blood money. This what a, was- What a farce, a bunch of murderers talking about blood money. <laughs> what a farce. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so we can't take it, our hands are clean. Right, so so they'll take it, but they can't put it in the treasury, right? Yeah. The other ones you told, you to kill them for the thing. So they understood that, you know, there's spiritual blessings coming from doing good and giving, right? So if there's spiritual blessings of that, there must be the exact opposite for not doing, all right? Or for, or for blood money, for hire. You get what I'm saying? So, continue. Verse seven, and they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, the field was called the field of blood unto this day. All right, so because that was blood money, all right? They didn't put it in the treasury. They took counsel and they bought, they used it for something else. They bought them the porter, the potter's field to bury strangers in. All right? So not even their own kind. Would, would, they would bury people they don't know, that they don't care for. All right? Continue. Verse 9. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy or Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Alright? So that was fulfilled what was spoken of Jeremiah the prophet. We're gonna continue. We're gonna we're gonna go into the new international encyclopedia of Bible characters. Alright, and we're gonna look at a specific somebody uh, here called Ananias. Alright, and this was in the New Testament. This was after Christ. Um this was after Christ. Alright, the time of Ananias here. Alright? So this is the New International Encyclopedia of Bible Characters by Paul D. Gardner. Ananias, Hebrew meaning, the Lord has been gracious. Verse 1, Ananias, husband to Sapphira, was one of the early converts in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem church, according to Acts 5. In those days, Christians had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. All right, so after Christ died, completed his mission. All right, the apostles, this is the, during the time of, you know, the 12 there. Um, you know, they're starting up the ministry, the Christian ministries. All right, so during this time, everybody had everything in common. Okay, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. So anyone that belonged to the church, that belonged to Christ's setup, his camp, this was after the whole 3,000 being baptized um, in Acts second chapter. All right, they made sure that nobody had no need. All right, within their camp. Continue. Following this practice, Ananias and Sapphira decided to sell property. With the full knowledge of his wife, he decided to hold back some of the money for personal use. 
He then presented, presented the, the proceeds to Peter, who, under guidance from the Holy Spirit, realized what had happened and accused Ananias of lying to God. All right, so here, all right, remember, they had everything in common. All right? So Ananias decided to sell a property. All right? He decided to sell his property to give to the church. All right? With, with full knowledge, with the full knowledge of his wife, he decided to hold back some of the money for personal use. So his wife knew about this too. All right? That, okay, now that they got... Now that they got the money for the property, after selling the property, I guess it was so much in abundance that now he's like, yo, this is, this is a lot of money. I could, I could hold back some for personal use. <laughs> okay? All right? And, you know, Peter, who under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, realized what happened and accused Ananias of lying to God. All right, continue. On hearing this, Ananias fell down dead, and his wife later entered. Sorry, and his wife later entered. She could. When his wife? When his wife later entered, she continued the lie and also died. It is important to see the issue here was not. It is important to see that the issue here was not a law that they had to share everything. Indeed, Peter made the point that what belonged to them was theirs. The problem was the deliberate and willful attempt to lie to the Holy Spirit and God's people. Sapphira's sin was spelled out by Peter. How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? For Christians, one of the privileges being a Christian is to be free from legalism. Peter and the early church were now creating some new binding law by which people might earn merit before God and the church. Rather, they were seeking to live lives that would reflect his love and grace seen in Jesus Christ. With such freedom to work out what is right in, 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 in individual lives by way of service, goes a great responsibility to be honest and open before the Lord and his people. The result of this sad episode in the early church was an increased understanding of and fear of the Lord's power and, ho and holiness. All right, so again, like I was saying earlier that your life is a test, all right? Your whole life is a test from God. And Ananias, he was being tested, but he didn't know that he was going to die right after for fulfilling the test. He didn't know that the Most High was going to come swiftly. All right? So what was mentioned here was he lied to the Holy Spirit and God's people. Because why? Christ told us that he wouldn't leave, he wouldn't leave his apostles comfortless. So, um, in Acts, the second chapter, they were gifted with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, which is, which is um, the church's birthday. All right? So, the, them being the church got a gift from God. All right? And the Holy Spirit was with them now. All right, so Ananias and his wife was supposed to be in Christ with the Holy Spirit. And because they didn't come truthfully, all right, and held back a portion, they basically lied because their first thought was, I'm going to sell this property and whatever I get, it's going to the church. When they got it, now their mind changed. All right, greed kept crept in. All right, they didn't willingly want to give the whole thing anymore. And even that's fine anyway. 
Mm -hmm. it's just a matter of them lying about mm -hmm. it. They lied about it. That was the main thing. And after Ananias dropped down dead, his wife comes now and keeps up the lie. All right? She did not come truthfully neither. So guess what happened to her? She dropped down dead too. All right? Same thing happened to your husband. Same thing. You sticking by your husband? You two are one? No problem. <laughs> right? All right? So this was a time, again, in, the, in Ananias' time, they were supposed to have all things in common. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. It's Acts chapter 2, verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. All right? So, again, just like what was being mentioned, um, all that believed were together, okay? All that believed in Christ were together, like how we're supposed to be, all right? And had all things in common, all right? and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need, except for Ananias, right? So let's look at somebody who did sell their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need, all right? We're going to look at Barnabas, all right? And, uh, you know, we're going to look at him particularly from an excerpt out a book called Character Sketches. So this is an excerpt from Character Sketches, Volume 3, First Edition. Character Sketch of Barnabas. How did Barnabas indicate his character? The man's given name was Joseph, but he was surnamed Barnabas by the Apostles. In Aramaic, which the Apostles spoke, Barnabas means son of prophecy, but the Greek translation given by Luke is son of consolation. This is the same word used by the Lord when referring to the Holy Spirit, whose ministry is to exhort, console, and encourage. In the city of Antioch, Barnabas, Simeon, and Lucius functioned as prophets. Their task was to proclaim the good news of salvation in Christ Jesus. Manan and Paul were the teachers. Theirs was the task of instructing the believers in foundational doctrine. Exhortation was an important aspect of prophecy as illustrated in Acts 15, verse 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets, also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Barnabas was engaged in this ministry at Antioch. He exhorted them all that with purpose of their heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Why was Barnabas able to discern Saul's motives? There is a rare biblical eulogy given to Barnabas, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Three things characterized Barnabas. First, he was a good man. James described the good man as one who had compassion on the needy. Okay, so what the first thing that made or the first thing that characterized Barnabas was he was a good man because he had compassion on the needy. Alright, continue. Barnabas had pity for the poor. He removed any barrier between himself and the Lord. Proverbs 21 verse 13 states, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Second, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was obedient to the prompting of God's Spirit and did not grieve him. All right, so the second thing, that characterized Barnabas was he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we know he's good 
Because he got the Holy Spirit. If he wasn't good, he would not be able to attain the Holy Spirit. If he wasn't in Christ. All right? He was obedient to the prompting of God's Spirit and did not grieve him. All right? Did not grieve the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. All right? Continue. Barnabas was in a position to receive spiritual discernment concerning Saul's character and motives. Third, he was a man of faith. He was able to visualize the great work which God had planned for Saul. While others were dwelling on Saul's past, Barnabas was focusing on his future. How did Barnabas' generosity encourage others? Barnabas' gift was held up as an example for others to follow. He contrasted with Ananias and Sapphira, who also sold a possession but kept back some of the money for themselves, lying to the apostles. All right, so Barnabas, Barnabas' gift was held up as an example for others to follow. All right, he contrasted with Ananias and Sapphira. All right, so he contrasted them because he, he gave and didn't hold back. All right, so this was... Barnabas is a perfect example of what to do, all right? And he was a leader, all right? He was a leader in the church. He was, he was seen as a, he was seen as a, um, a prophet, all right? He functioned as a prophet. Their task was to proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, all right? Continue. Barnabas had been exhorting the disciples in Antioch for a year when a need was revealed concerning their fellow believers in Judea. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Barnabas was able to teach about giving because he practiced it himself. He was an example to the Apostle Paul who encouraged the Gentile churches throughout the Roman Empire to contribute to the needs of their poorer brothers in Christ. All right, so Barnabas was able to teach about giving, all right, because he practiced it himself. Barnabas sold property and gave all what he got from selling that property to the church, okay? He understood that his inhibit the land that he had, the property that he had, because him being a Levite, right? The property that he had, he understood that it came from God. So for him, there was no there was no um doubt that you know God wanted him to do this and was testing it. And he passed with flying colors, right? Because he understood that the church, there was a lot of needy in the church. And by him selling his possessions and giving it to the church, it would be able to sustain everyone that had need, all right? Not shortening the hand of God, all right? Because these people that were in need, they were coming to God. And how it are they to see that God's providing for them if there wasn't someone like Barnabas to show that perfect example and, pro and help, you know, fulfill those needs of the people. All right? So this increased the people's faith. All right? The same faith that, that was being mentioned that Barnabas had here he was able to shed some off onto the people just by this action here. All right, continue. This was, no, this was no doubt a major factor in the mutual love and cooperation which developed between the Gentile and the Jewish Christians. Okay, so it, it's made mention here. This was no doubt a major factor in the mutual love 
and cooperation which developed between Gentile and Jewish Christians. All right, him being a Levite, him being a Jewish Christian. All right, how was he to show the Gentiles then that are coming to Christ now that yo Christ is here? All right, how will you know whose are his? Right, he has to come with these things that Christ been teaching us to do all the way from Old Testament time, all right? He freely gave. It wasn't a tenth of what he sold as a possession, all right? He didn't give a tithe, all right? He gave a gift, all right? A true tithe, all right? More than a tithe, more than a tenth, all right? He gave an offering, an oblation, a bloodless oblation. St. Mark chapter 12 verse 15 Shall we give or shall we not give? But he knowing their hypocrisy said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it and he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Christ, our Lord and Savior, just finished giving the parable of the wicked husbandman. All right? And the Pharisees, them understanding again, because, you know, they coming at Christ, and Christ always cutting them up. All right, they understand in that, hey, this parable that, you know, Christ just gave of the wicked husbandmen, this is referring to us. This, this is talking about us, and, and, and they didn't like it. So what they did was they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. All right, so when they came to him, they spoke to him and said, Master, we know that thou art true and cares for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? So they're asking, you know, hey, since you're a man of God, all right, they're trying to trip him up again, always trying to come and trip up Christ. Should we give or not, right? Christ answered and said, Render unto Caesar the things of Caesar, and render unto God the things of that are God's. All right, plain and simple. So today's day in government, I mean today's day and age, the you know Caesar is the government. Caesar's government at that time. Caesar Caesar's the government at that time. You know today's day and age, we have governments. All right, and then. There's God, right? So we have to pay taxes just like how we have to pay taxes to the government. All right? What about our taxes to God? All right? And this is what Christ is making mention here. All right? Just like how the government set up taxes, who do you think they learned that from? All right? So if you know you're give if you know you're paying taxes to the government, why not to God? Is the government your God? Right? Is there any spiritual blessings coming from, you know, giving taxes to the government? No, you get a pat on the back. And next year, do it again. All right? But with God, we understand that when, when we do the things that he asks of us, when we do the things that he's trying to teach us to do, in righteousness, in the right manner, willingness of the heart, there are spiritual bl blessings that are attached to that. All right? Let's go to St. Matthew chapter 15. St. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. And Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way alright so 
Christ is calling to his disciples here and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Okay? Why does he have compassion on the multitude? Because they continue with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. They haven't eaten for three days. All right? Continuing with Christ. They recognize, yo, the light is here on earth. I want to be by that light. I don't want to leave. I want to stay with this guy. All right? So Christ, is, Christ understands that, hey, if they continue, their bodies are not going to have the strength. They're going to faint. All right? And I don't want this to happen because, you know, someone could see that and turn it into something bad right away. All right? Saying, oh, this is what this guy's putting you guys through? Huh? He's not even feeding you? All right? Physically, he's feeding you spiritually, but... You need some sort of physical sustenance. All right, continue. Verse 33. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? All right, so his disciples is letting them know that we, we don't have that much food to, to be able to supply all these people here. All right, continue. Verse 34. And Jesus said unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes, and gave thanks, and brake them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled. And they took up the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full. And they did eat, for 4,000 men beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. All right, so Christ was able to produce enough to suffice 4,000 men beside women, beside women and children. All right? He was able to display physically, give a physical example of the spiritual gifts that were attached to giving. All right? He set up and charged his disciples to, you know what? We're gonna feed them with this bread. We're gonna give them this bread. All right? We're gonna sustain these guys. It's gonna be enough because I'm here. All right? So this is how they were able to do that. Because Christ was able to provide the abundance, all right? He was able to bring those spiritual bless blessings in a physical form so that he could suffice 4,000 men, women, and children, all right? Uh, let's continue. We're going to go to St. Mark chapter 12. St. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much. Christ sat over the treasury because he want to see what people are casting in, who's casting what, all right? Who's paying tithes? Who's giving tribute to the church? Who's coming to pay their respects and honor? Who's bringing a present, a gift to God? All right? Continue. Verse 42. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a father. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in, sorry, verse 44, and they all, for all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her wants did cast in all that she had, even all her living. All right, so Christ is letting them know what this poor widow did. All right, let's get this same this same um, story out of St. Luke. 
St. Luke chapter 22 verse 1 And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury Alright, so in Luke It's being mentioned that The rich men casting their gifts into the treasury Okay, their tithes Alright, tithe is a gift Alright, so it was instituted first as a commandment Alright, but it's really supposed to be tithe. Alright, tithe is an offering. Alright, aka an oblation. Aka a gift, a present. Alright, continue. This is verse 2. And he saw also a, poor, a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. All right, so Christ understood this was a widow. All right, she has no husband. So she can't be casting in like these rich men are casting in. All right. She cast in two mites. And two mites is not a lot of money. Alright? You could look at that as two pennies. Alright? But that was all that she had. And Christ understood this. That that was all that she had. She could have cast it in one penny. And that would have been more than the tenth. That would have been more than the tithe. Alright? But she gave her two pennies. Because she understood that there was a spiritual gift that was attached to giving. All right? So Christ is just making them know here that she gave all her abundance even though she didn't have to. And she gave it willingly. All right? She gave it willingly. All right? Out of the goodness of her heart. She wanted the Most High to have it. She understood that, hey, these two pennies that I have, I've had it because, you know, it came from the Lord. So why not give it back to the Lord? All right? So she understood that the blessings that comes with giving and, and, and giving honor to the Lord and honoring Him with tithes or a gift. Let's go to St. John chapter 10. To St. John chapter 10 verse 17 Therefore doth my father love me Because I lay down my life That I might take it again No man taketh it from me But I lay it down of myself I have power to lay it down And I have power to take it again This commandment have I received of my father Alright so Christ is letting us know here That the father loves him because of the gift that he's giving for mankind. All right? Which is his life that he's laying down for us. Christ promised Adam this, that he would redeem him. And so said, so done. And this commandment, he's, he's letting us know that he received from the father and he's doing it. And the father loved him because he keeping this commandment. And part of the commandment was lay down your life for the brethren. So mankind could have a way back to God. First John chapter 3. This is First John chapter 3 verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Alright, so just like how Christ laid down his life, a.k.a. God, alright, the creator of heaven, earth, and everything in it that came and created things according to his Father's will, which is his God, that he always speaks of, alright, that we wouldn't know about if he never revealed it to us, that he has a Father, alright, this same Christ, alright, he loves us because he laid down his life for us. And just like how he laid down his life for us, us being in Christ, we ought to follow suit. 
like a good servant and soldier of the Most High. All right? We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren too. All right? This is righteous. This is good. This is a great gift. All right? You can lay down your life for your friend. That, that's a great gift. It doesn't take money to do this. All right? This is a different type of gift. All right? And this is what we ought to do, as the scripture is telling us here. All right? We're going to go into the Dead Sea Scrolls, the community rule, and see if, if um, you know, they have anything over there that follows the same suit and of the same things that we've been reading and been speaking about. All right, let's get that. So this is the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Community Rule 7. When these become part of the community in Israel, according to these rules, they shall establish the spirit of holiness as eternal truth. They shall atone for guilty rebellion and the sin of unfaithfulness and shall gain divine acceptance of the land without the flesh of holocaust and the fat of sacrifices and offerings and the correct free will gift of the lips shall be like a fragrance of righteousness and the perfection of the way like the free will offering of agreeable tribute okay so here in the dead sea scrolls the community rule um chapter seven here says when these become part of the community when these become part of the community in Israel, according to these rules, they shall establish the spirit of holiness as eternal truth. All right? They shall atone for guilty rebellion and the sin of unfaithfulness and shall gain divine acceptance for the land without the flesh of holocaust. And the fat of sacrifices and offerings. Alright? So, this is how you establish the spirit of holiness. Alright? Without the flesh. Alright? And the fat of sacrifices and offerings. Okay? And the correct free will gift of the lips shall be like a fragrance of righteousness and perfection. All right? A free will gift, free will offering. All right? It's the same thing. Offering of agreeable tribute. All right? So a free will offering. All right? So what's being made mention here is this is a, an agreeable tribute, a free will offering. This is what we were to are to give up to the most high. Alright, as a gift. Alright? Gift of the lips. Alright? Praising, praises and blessings to the most high. Alright, let's continue. Let's go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the exhortation. This is the Dead Sea Scrolls the exhortation. This is the rule for the congregation by, by which it shall provide for all its needs. They shall place the earnings of at least two days out of every month into the hands of the guardian and the judges. And from it, they shall give to the fatherless. And from it, they shall succor the poor and the needy, the aged, the aged sick, and the man who is stricken with disease, the captive taken by foreign people, the virgin with no near kin and the maid for whom no man cares and this is the exact statement of the assembly all right so in the dead sea scrolls all right the community is being exhorted here with this rule this is the rule of the congregation by which it shall provide for all its needs all right the congregation has needs it must be, those needs must be provided. All those needs must be provided for by the congregation itself. All right? Meaning we should come together. 
have all things in common. Just like we've seen um, the apostles and the people that were coming to Christ in, in Acts. All right? Where everyone had things in common. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this community, they believe in having all things in common too. So much so that they set this up as a rule. All right? Amongst the congregation of the community. All right? Meaning that they're going to provide for everyone. So when you come in here, you're going to surrender all your stuff like everybody else. All right? So that we can provide for everybody's needs. All right? So it says here, they shall place the earnings of at least two days out of every month into the hands of the guardian and the judges, the guardian and the judges of the congregation here, of the community, all right? And from it, they shall give to the fatherless, they shall um, succor the poor and the needy, the aged, the aged sick, and the man who is stricken with disease, all right? The captive taken by a foreign people, the virgin with no kin, and the maid for whom no man cares, all right? So they're going to provide for all these people, all right? Because this was the rule that was set up in this community, to be self-sufficient, all right? When you're coming to the Lord, the Lord must be able to provide. All right? So with them understanding that, they knew that they had to build up their treasury. They had to build up the storehouse of God so that they can complete um they can complete this task of providing for those that are in need. All right? Just like how Christ provided for us by dying on the cross and fulfilling a spiritual need that we had. All right? By being able to come back to the Father. All right? That was the need that he was fulfilling. All right? The, the severed connection that we had, he was able to mend that back. All right, so those are just examples of spiritual needs that Christ fulfilled. All right, and there's also physical needs that, you know, that people may have while here on the earth. All right. Um, we're going to go into the Apostolic Constitution. Uh, chapter 25. And it's of first fruits and tithes, and what, and after what manner the bishop is himself to partake of them, or to distribute them to to others. So this is the apost apostolic constitution, chapter twenty-five, of first fruits and tithes, and after what manner the bishop is himself to partake of them, and to distribute to others. Let him. Let him use those tenths and first fruits which are given according to the command of God as a man of God. Let, let him dispense in a right manner the free will offering which are brought in on account of the poor, the orphans, the widows, the afflicted, and the strangers in distress, as having that God for the examiner of his accounts who hath committed the disposition to him. Moreover, Distribute with righteousness to all those who are in want, and use yourselves the things which belong to the Lord, but do not abuse them, eating of them, but not eating them all up by yourselves. Communicate with those that are in want, and thereby show yourselves unblameable before God. For if ye shall consume them by yourselves, ye shall be reproached by God, who saith, as to the insatiable and selfish devourers, ye eat up the milk and clothe yourselves with the wool. And in another passage, 
must ye alone live upon the earth? On which account ye are commanded in the law, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All right. So here in the apostolic constitution, in this first paragraph here, they break it down. Um, how to dispense in a right manner the free will offering, which are brought in on account of the poor, the orphans, the widows, the afflicted, and the stranger in distress. All right, so the free will offerings that are in the treasury are supposed to be used on the account of the poor, the orphan, the widows, the afflicted, the strangers in distress. All right, everyone who's in want and need and coming to God. All right, this is why we are to have a treasury. All right, this is what the tents and the first fruits are to be used for. All right? Continue. Now, we say these things not as if ye might not partake of the fruits of your labors, for it is written, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox which treadeth, treadeth out the corn, but that ye should do it with moderation and righteousness. As therefore the ox that laboreth in the threshing floor without a muzzle eateth indeed, but doth not eat all up, so do ye who labor in the threshing floor, that is, in the church of God, eat of the church, which was, which was also the case of the Levites who served in the tabernacle of testimony, which was in all things a type of the church. Okay, so it's letting you know that, it's letting you know here that the bishop is to partake into these things too, but he's not the only one that lives on the earth. So don't eat it all, but in moderation, all right? Because these things are set up to not only suffice the bishop, but those that are under the bishop as well, all right? Those that are under Christ, those that are part of the church, all right? These tents and the first fruits is supposed to suffice everybody. It's even giving an example in, in the law of nature here where it's making mention that thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox which treadeth out of the corn, but that ye should do it with moderation and righteousness. As therefore the ox that laboreth in, threshing, in the threshing floor without a muzzle eateth indeed, but does not eat all up so do ye who labor in the threshing floor that is in the church of God all right if you're laboring in the church of God eat of the church all right you're able to eat of the church but just keep in mind in moderation and righteousness all right continue moreover also its very name implied that the tabernacle was foreappointed for a testimony of the church. Here, therefore, the Levites who attended upon the tabernacle partook of those things which were offered to God by all the people, namely gifts, offerings, and firstfruits, and tithes, and sacrifices, and oblations without disturbance. They and their wives and their sons and their daughters since their employment was the ministration of the tabernacle, therefore they had not only lot or inheritance in the land among the children of Israel, because the oblations of the people were the lot of Levi and the inheritance of their tribe. All right. So it's making mention that their family partook in these things. All right. Since their employment was the ministration of the tabernacle, therefore they had not any lot or inheritance in the land among the children of Israel because the oblations of the people were the lot of Levi and the inheritance of their tribe, all right? Because they belonged, Levites, like we read earlier in the lesson, they belonged to God, all right? So whatever the children of Israel were bringing to God, 
they were able to partake in it being representations and attached to God. All right? Continue. Ye therefore, at the present day, bishops are to your people priests and Levites, ministering to the holy tabernacle, the holy Catholic Church, who stand at the altar of the Lord your God, and offer to him reasonable and unbloody sacrifices through Jesus, the great high priest. Ye are, ye are to the laity prophets, rulers, governors, and kings, the mediators between God and his faithful people, who receive and declare his word, well acquainted with the scriptures. Ye are the voice of God and witnesses of his will, who bear the sins of all, and intercede for all whom, as ye have heard, the word se severely threateneth. If ye hide from men the key of knowledge, who are liable to perdition, if ye do not declare his will to the people that are under you, who shall have a sure reward from God, and unspeakable honor and glory, if ye duly minister to the holy tabernacle. For as yours is the burden, so ye receive as your fruit the supply of food and other necessities. For ye imitate Christ the Lord, and as he bare the sins of us all upon the tree at his crucifixion, the innocent for those who deserved punishment, so also ye are owed to make the sins of the people your own. For concerning our Savior, it is said in Isaiah, he beareth our sins and is afflicted for us. And again, he bare the sins of many and was delivered for their offenses. As therefore ye are patterns of others, so ye have Christ for your pattern. As therefore he himself is the pattern for you all, so are ye for the laity under you. Think not that the office of a bishop is an easy or light burden, as therefore ye bear the weight, so ye have a right to partake of the fruits before others and to impart to those that are in want, having to give an account to him who without bias will examine your accounts. Continue. Mm -hmm. For they who attend upon the church ought to be maintained by the church as being priests, Levites, presidents, and ministers of God. All right, so it's just making mention here that it's not just for... for um, the ones who represent the church, but the ones who are also part of the church. All right. Um, continue. As it is written in the book of Numbers concerning the priests, and the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and the house of thy family shall bear the iniquities of the sanctuary and of your priesthood. Behold, I have given unto you the charge of the first fruits. From all that are sanctified to me by the children of Israel, I have given them for a reward to thee, and to thy sons after thee, by an ordinance forever. This shall be yours out of the holy things, out of the oblations, and out of the gifts, and out of all the sacrifices, and out of every trespass offering and sin offering, and all that they render unto me out of their holy things, they shall belong to thee and to thy sons. In the sanctuary shall they eat them, and a little after, all the first fruits of the oil and of the wine and of the wheat and all that they shall give unto the Lord, to thee have I given them. And all that is first ripe unto thee have I given it, and every devoted thing, every firstborn of man and of beast, clean and unclean, and the breast and the right shoulder of a sacrifice appertain to the priests and to the rest who continue with them, namely the Levites. All right, so it's just reiterating that was set up in the Old Testament. The, set, the same setup that was in the Old Testament when the children of Israel had to bring their tithes and first fruits to the priests and the Levites, all right? It's making mention that, you know, now, 
now that we have a church or now that there's an actual church set up instead of a tabernacle like in times past all right those same things that were offered to the levites and to the priests to do according to the will of god is the same thing that's you know that is that is offered to us you know to be used for the will of god and it's not just for us all right just like how we read in the community rule, we have to sustain the whole church, all right? The church God needs, all right? Um, and we want to be self-sustainable. All right, so... Um, so, okay. so this is why... It's making mention here and break, being breaking down that this is why it was given um, to them for the charge of the first fruits. All right. From all that are sanctified to me by the children of Israel, have I given them for a reward to thee? All right. Being the representatives of Christ here on earth. All right. Continue. Hear this, ye of the lady also. The elect church of God. All right, so the clergy. For the people were formerly called the people of God and the holy nation. Ye therefore are the holy and sacred church of God. Okay, you're the holy and sacred church of God. Enrolled in heaven, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a bride adorned for the Lord, for the Lord God, a great church, a faithful church, Hear attentively now what has now what was said formerly. All right, so we're gonna bring it around up full circle now. They're gonna bring it around full circle now. Continue. Oblations and tithes belong to Christ, our high priest, and to those who minister to him. Okay, oblations and tithes belong to Christ, our high priest, and to those who minister to him, which are the priests. The priests be ministering to God on behalf of of the children of Israel, all right, or the children of the church, all right, continue. Tithes, tithes of salvation are the first letter of the name of Jesus. Here, the holy Catholic church, who has escaped the ten plagues, and has received the ten commandments, and has learned the law, and has kept the faith, and has believed in Jesus, and are named after his name, and art established and shineth and shinest in the, con in the consummation of his glory. Those which were then the sacrifices and our prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings. All right, so those which were then the sacrifices, all right, in the Old Testament are now prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving. Thanksgivings. All right, continue. Those which were then first fruits and tithes and offerings and gifts are now oblations, which are presented by the holy bishops to the Lord God through Jesus Christ, who hath died for them. All right, so those which were then first fruits and tithes and offerings and gifts are now oblations. And we know what an oblation is. All right, it's a gift, it's a present. An oblation is an offering. All right, so those things, still the same things, but they're no longer called first fruits or referred to as first fruits, tithes, offerings, and gifts. They're now called oblations. All right, this is the true name for it, but oblations meaning tithes or offerings or first fruits, whatever the fruits be, all right, whether it be of man, whether it be of of animal or whether it be of uh, vegetable kingdoms, first fruits or and gifts, right? Which are the free will offerings, things along those, you know, that nature um, are now oblations, all right? Oblations going back to being bloodless um, sacrifices, a present, all right? Tribute. A gift. All right, continue. For these are your high priests, as the presbyters are your priests. 
and your present deacons are instead of the Levites, as are also your readers, your singers, your porters, your deaconesses, your widows, your virgins, and your orphans. But he who is above all, these is the high priest. All right, which is Christ. Our high priest is high Yeshua Christ, our Lord and Savior, a.k.a. Jesus Christ. All right? So, tithing, all right, the Most High in, introduced and commanded us to tithe because in order to teach us how to properly give a gift out of the willingness of our heart. All right? Willingly. The way to give gifts correctly. All right? Let's continue. We're almost done here. Um, we're going to go to On Christian Doctrine, Book 1, Chapter 1. So this is On Christian Doctrine, Book 1, Chapter 1. The interpretation of scripture depends on the discovery and enunciation of the meaning and is to be under undertaken in dependence on God's aid. This one. There are two things on which all interpretation of scripture depends. The mode of ascertaining the proper meaning and the mode of making known the meaning when it is ascertained. We shall treat first of the mode of ascertaining next to the mode of making known the meaning a great and arduous undertaking and one that if if difficult to carry out it is i fear presumptuous to enter upon and presumptuous it would be undoubtedly and presumptuous it would undoubtedly be if i were counting on my own strength but since my hope of accomplishing the work rests on him who has already supplied me with many thoughts on the subject. I do not fear but that he will go on to supply what is yet wanting when once I have become begun to use what he has already given. For a possession which is not diminished by being shared with others, if it is possessed and not shared, is not yet possessed as it ought to be possessed. The Lord says, whosoever has, to him shall be given. Matthew 13, verse 12. He will give then to those who have, that is to say, if they use freely and cheerfully what they have received, he will add to and perfect his gift. The loaves in the miracle were only five and seven in number before the disciples began to divide them among the hungry people. All right, so here... He's letting us know the breakdown of, of the spiritual gifts behind giving, all right? Giving freely and cheerfully, all right? And it's breaking down what we read earlier in regards to Christ feeding the multitude, all right? So it's giving us a little bit of detail here as to the miracle that was being done here, all right? Christ... Um, showing us that physical example of spiritual gifts that are attached to giving. All right, continue. But when once they began to distribute them, mm -hmm. but when once they began to distribute them, though the wants of so many thousands were satisfied, they filled baskets with the fragments that were left. Now, okay, so it's saying um, the loaves in the miracle were only five and seven in number before the disciples began to divide them among the hungry people. But when once they began to distribute them, all right, Though the wants of so many thousands were satisfied, which was 4,000, they filled baskets with the fragments that were left. All right? So they were able to still fill the baskets with the fragments of loaves that were left. 
after satisfying the thousands of people. Continue. Now, just as the bread increased in the very act of breaking it, so those thoughts which the Lord has already vouchsafed to me with a view to undertaking this work will, as soon as I begin to impart them to others, be multiplied by His grace, so that in this very work of distribution in which I have engaged, so far from incurring loss and poverty, I shall be made to rejoice in a marvelous increase of wealth. Okay, so... Um, here it's being mentioned that for a possession which is not diminished by being shared with others, if it is possessed and not shared, is not yet possessed as it ought to be possessed. All right, because it has to be shared. Okay? In order to receive of the gift that comes behind this giving, all right, in order to fully get this gift, you have to share it. All right, this is how it comes. This is why there's spiritual gifts behind giving. All right, we can't see it with our eyes, but it's there. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. All right. So in order for us to access that these gifts, all right? We have to access it by giving. All right? So we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and look at the imperable gift um, that God gave to us. <coughs> So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But remember this, he who sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he who sows generously shall reap also generously. Okay, so this is the rule of thumb that's being set up for this. All right. He who sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he who sows generously shall reap also generously. All right, continue. Verse 7. So let every man give according to what he has de decided in his mind, not grudgingly or of necessity. Like, like Ananias, all right, and his wife. All right, continue. For God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver like Barnabas. All right. God loves a cheerful giver, okay? One where he don't have to tell them or put an exact amount on how much you got to give, okay? Where he don't have to command you to give a tenth. Rich men, they're putting in, when they were putting in the treasury, it was the rich men that he was looking at and comparing them to the, to the widow. The rich men, they're giving, they're just giving the tithe. The tenth. Mm -hmm. They're rich, so a tenth to them is nothing. Yes. It's not a lot to give. All right? So there's no giving cheerfully, giving abundantly behind that. Yeah. that that's, they that's, were giving sparingly. That's why Christ right? said to the rich man, give a gold cell. All your oh, possessions. Right to the commandment. And give everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Because if those guys would have said, okay, let me just give everything I have, they would have matched the widow. Right. He would have matched her. Right. They they were only giving, these rich men were only giving a port, like a small um what was commanded of them. You get what I'm saying? Because they had to. Oh, we gotta do this, we gotta give tithes. Yeah. Everybody knows we rich, so if we don't you know what I mean? <laughs> if if we don't give, then you know, we not doing the things we're that we're supposed to be doing. Right, so it's easy to give when you have a lot. Like it's easy to give a tenth when you got a lot, right? But what manner are you giving? Now the woman, she didn't have a lot, so she gave her all. Mm -hmm. Can a rich man give their all? It's no. too no, they can't, right? But the woman that didn't have much, she gave only a little. But it's everything. But 
it was everything, that little bit was everything that she had. So really and truly, the measurement of that little bit was really great. Of course. For, for, uh, to the person who's giving. Mm -hmm. Right? To the person who's giving. Yes, yeah. was at work and... Um... And, so like it. and because she was giving a little bit, or because she gave her all, she gave generously. All right? She was giving generously. And that's what Christ was looking for. Verse 8. God is able to make all goodness abound to you. And may you always have enough of everything for yourselves. And may you abound in every good work. All right? So God is able to make all goodness abound to you. And you may always have enough of everything for yourselves. And you may abound in every good work. Continue. Verse 9. As it is written, he has distributed liberally and given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. Now he who gives seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and cause the fruits of your righteousness to grow, that you may be enriched in everything, in all Liberally, liberty, liberality, liberality. <laughs> for such generosity enables us to perfect thanksgiving to God. All right. So this act of generosity of giving, all right, giving bountifully, all right, enables us to perfect the thanksgiving of God. All right. This is what God trying to teach us. Okay, continue. Verse 12. For the administration of this service not only supplies the wants of the saints, but it, but, is, but it also is made abundant by many thanksgivings to God. All right, so it's being mentioned here. For the administration of this service, all right, this giving, not only supplies the wants of the saints, the people that are in Christ, but it also is made abundant by many thanksgivings to God. All right? It's made abundantly. It's made more abundant. Okay, continue. Verse 13. By this experiment of charitable service, they glorify God in that you have subjected yourselves to the faith of the gospel of Christ. And through your generosity, you have become partakers with them and with all men. And they offer prayer on your behalf with greater love because of the abundance of the grace of God, which has been on you. Thanks be to God for his incomparable gift. All right, so that's the in 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 incomparable gift. All right that God bestowed, all right, which enables us to perfect thanksgiving, okay, by giving. And this is why he instituted tithes as a commandment first, in order to teach us how to give correctly, to give cheerfully, to give abundantly, to give generously, willingly, with a good heart, to know that when you're giving, you're giving to Christ. You're giving to God. All right? That gift that was set up for a specific use. All right? Even though you may not see the specific use, but it's being used to keep the charge of the most high all right so that was the importance of you know understanding tithes and exactly why it's being instituted you know in times past you know i i can see that you know that word tithes or tithing has left a terrible taste in people's mouth because there are churches and there are people that take full advantage of the things and don't do what God would like us to do with the tithes, all right? He always makes mention of 
the widow, the fatherless, the Levite, the stranger, those that are less fortunate. Mm -hmm. All right? This is what it's supposed to be saved for. So that they could see the glory of God through you. God could be glorified through your actions that he been teaching you to do. All right? So that's the importance of tithes. Is to learn how to give properly, the correct way. With a good heart and a contrite spirit. All right? So with that being said, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. All right. So hopefully that, you know, this lesson that was, that was brought out today, you know, was true and honest and pure. Um, you know, just like the scriptures say, think on these things and, you know, reflect and, you know, try to do the same. You know, do the things that God's teaching you because these spiritual gifts that are coming behind these things that we're supposed to do is, 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 very, is very great and, it's, and it's, it's good in the sight of the Most High. It's honorable. All right? And this is what it means to be righteous. All right? So, you know, all praises to the Most High. A high Yeshua Christ um, for allowing me to, you know, bring forth this understanding on tithes, um, you know, to better, uh, you know, to better, um, so lucky I can't even find the words anymore, but, um, you know, to better train us into, into being sons and sons of God and, and, and children of light. And to keep walking in the light since we come from the light. All right. So those that would take heed to these things and take heed to, you know, the things of God and, and what God wants us to do. You know, that's how you know that you're of the light. All right. So just keep doing the things that, you know, the most high expects from you. So with that being said, once again, all praises be unto the most high almighty, Ahaya Shahaya Christ, our Lord and Savior. Um, we are the Essene Community Church of Christ. My name is Bishop Tabak. And I'm Brother Saul. And that was today's um, Sabbath report slash lesson.